Okay, this is the very first call, the very first Nebula program call. Um, and this is the very first cohort and the first lesson. So I'm so excited to have you all here. Um, so today we're going to spend just a few minutes running through the basics, um, through the things that you'll need to know for future calls. Um, so thanks to the pandemic, perhaps we're a bit more used to online calls than we were five or six years ago. Uh, but I'm going to repeat a lot of the things that we asked just to make sure that we're all starting from the same place. Um, so first of all, um, we have otter.ai uh, transcripts running at the moment. Uh, so if you look at the top left of your screen, on my screen, it says Otter AI, click here to open live transcript. Now, the reason that we use this, there's uh, two or three different reasons. One is that if English isn't your first language, and sometimes reading what other people are saying can make following along easier. Um, I've had people with ADHD say, I got distracted, but Otter helped me. Uh, and the third option is that sometimes we are not all people who, who can hear. Um, and this is a way to make sure that everyone participates equally and can tell what other people are doing. The other uh, thing with relation to that, uh, we recognize that you might be in a quiet room um, or in a place where you can't speak. Uh, maybe you're sitting uh, and taking this call with a baby on your knee and she's sleeping and you don't want to wake her up. Uh, so when we have breakout room discussions later in this call, there's two options, two ways to participate. You can participate spoken the way that I'm speaking now with the other people in your group, or you can alternatively, you can participate using um, the chat or the etherpad by typing. Um, so we call that spoken and written participation as the two options. There's uh, no reason, no requirements to choose one over the other. Uh, but when we need to sort people into rooms and uh, to make sure you reach the correct room, we ask that you modify your Zoom name so that we know which rooms to put you into. So, for example, if you see uh, Virginia and Irene both have S in front of their name, which means that they're preferring to use a spoken, break spoken breakout room. And I've put W in front of my name to indicate that I prefer a written breakout room. Um, now, if you've never changed your Zoom name before, I can tell you the way I do it. I can't promise it's the same on your computer. Um, but for me, I click on the participants window and then on the participants window, I click on my name and I click on the button that says more, a blue button that says more. And then I can click rename. So, for example, now I've just done that and then I could change from W to S to say that maybe I prefer a spoken breakout room. Um, if you can't do that, that is OK. Uh, we may ask you, we may reach out to ask you what your preference is. But if you can do it, it does help us out a lot. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a moment and give everyone a chance to add W or S in front of your name. And you can switch if you need to. Okay, thank you to everyone who put those in the chat as well. Uh, if you do that, then one of the call hosts will modify your name. Uh, so W is written if you're typing when you're participating, and S is for spoken if you prefer to speak, to unmute, to participate. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, oh. OK, uh, let me check. Are there any other things, other reminders that I need to do? There are. OK, right. A couple more reminders quickly, and then I'm going to pass this over to me. Yeah, I'm doing the next section as well. <laughs> Shows how very um, well I'm following what's going on here. Right. Other reminders. Anyway, you're all cool people. We have no doubt. Um, but sometimes misunderstandings can happen. Um, so we have a code of conduct. Uh, this is a document where we 
essentially ask that everyone treat other people in the OLS environment with the same respect that you would like to receive when people work with you. Um, and this is very, very important to us. The, uh, the core of OLS work is people work, is caring for one another. Um, so if at any point you feel like you have either experienced or witnessed something that might not be in line with the code of conduct, um, then we ask that you speak to us so that we can try and make sure that doesn't happen again in the future. Um, so of course, there's more to the code of conduct than be awesome to one another. So I do encourage you all to spend a minute or two looking at that after the call um, or even opening it up in a new tab right now. Um, but if anything does happen and you do need to make a report, lines 47 and 48 on the etherpad explain um, what to do. So we have the team email address, team at weroles.org. That reaches um, all of the organizers. Uh, but if for any reason you'd rather not reach the whole group, then it's also okay to email an individual. For example, if I do something nasty, you might want to tell Irene uh, so that she could handle it because telling me that I've been nasty might not be too useful. <laughs> um, and, oh, the other thing uh, we've, I've mentioned, we're recording. So, um, this call will be on YouTube. Breakout rooms don't go on YouTube. So for example, if you have your camera off now, when you go into a breakout room, if you turned your camera on, it wouldn't be recorded. Um, but I think that's all from the basic introduction stuff. Um, it's always okay to unmute and ask questions or type questions in the chat. Uh, we will always do our best to help you out. Uh, this is designed to be interactive and to be fun. Um, so this is why I should stop talking at you. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to do a quick lightning introduction round. Now, if you've been in in um, online introductions, sometimes someone um, you, you end up with one person who tells you about their cat and about what their grandmother ate for dinner last night. And they take half an hour just to introduce themselves. And whilst that is delightful because we love knowing about people, there's a lot of us here and we don't want to spend the whole call on introduction. Uh, so we're actually just going to ask for, I think, four words. Uh, so I am notorious for failing this after saying this is what we have to do, but I'm going to do my best. We're asking name, location, what project you're working on, and one hobby. So quick, and then uh, I will say who the next person is. And then, I'll, and then once the, well, that person's gone, I'll say what the next person is. So I'll start off. Hello, I am Yo. I am based in the United Kingdom. Um, I am the executive director of OLS. So that is my project. Um, and a hobby that I am working on at the moment is knitting. And I will pass it to Irene. Hi, my name is Irene or Irene. Uh, I live in Mexico City. My project is running the Nebula cohorts, and one hobby is reading. Thank you, Irene. Uh, Virginia? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Virginia. I'm from Argentina, where I'm currently now, although I am based on the UK. Um, I am going to be your expert for today, so that would be my project. And I really enjoy spending time outdoors. Thank you, Virginia. Swati? Second, I thought that I wasn't supposed to unmute myself. Right, hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm Swati. Um, what's the next thing? Yes, I'm in Germany, and I was actually looking at my mails to see what the project title was for me. <laughs> so I think it's like bio. I think it's on biomaterials for like tissue engineering and wound healing applications. Um, my hobby. I also like to read. So high five, Irene. So yeah, that's about it. And I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, the next person, Priya. Priya, if you're speaking, I'm afraid there's no sound coming through. Um, 
Priya, maybe if we come back to you, do, if you want to try again. Sorry. If you, if, you, if you type it out, we'll read. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll read out uh, from Dr. Salwan. Uh, with Sabwa, uh, Salwan Abdulatif, Iraq, President of Open Science Community, Iraq. Thank you so much. And what's one hobby? Or is that the hobby? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a minute to um, add that as well. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next person on my screen, uh, Anna. It's okay to write as well, if you prefer. No, no problem. I can speak too. Uh, hi, I'm Ana Luisa Moraes. I'm from Brazil. Uh, our project from uh, Luciana, Viviani and, and I is Human Rights Defender, Artificial Intelligence and Dirty to Protect. And uh, my hobby is painting and reading and writing too. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Luciana. Hello, nice to meet you all. My name is Luciana Valadares. I'm also from Brazil. I'm currently uh, based in the US. We will be living here until the end of June. And my project is also the Human Rights Def Defenders, AI and Duty, Duty to Protect. And I love running and I also love reading. Thank you so much, Luciana. Um, I have Priya's introduction. So I'm wearing my Priya mask right now. I hope you can tell. I am Priya, working in Germany on the single atom photocatalysis. My hobby is reading and listening to podcasts. Right, taking the Priya mask off. Uh, I will ah, read out Vivian. Hello, everyone. I'm Vivian. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Okay. Sao Paulo. Brazil, human right defenders, AI, and duty to protect. I love reading and writing. Sounds like we need a book club, my friends. Um, Ahmed, I'm sure. Tell me how badly did I mispronounce your name? Oh, you see it well. I hope you can hear me all. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Ahmed Unshur from Somalia. I currently live in Mogadishu, the capital city of Somalia. And my project is. Uh, focused on understanding the impact of social media on youth mental health. And one hobby, in fact, two hobbies are uh, reading science fiction movies and listening to podcasts, especially BBC Radio 4 podcasts. There's some amazing hobbies coming through here, my friends. Uh, I think the next person on my list who, oh, I have a written introduction from Heba. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, yes, I'm Heba from Egypt, Heba Fauzi from Egypt. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. So happy to have you here. Um, yeah. And loving, loving the hobby of reading. Uh, yes. I will... <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I will move to Denise. It's Would really... you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Or um, I am Denise. I'm coming from Germany and currently working on a project called ZooMap. This is for zoonotic risks from two species, one in Mongolia, the marmot, and the second one is the Philippine pangolin from the Philippines. And my hobby is doing nothing. Thank you. Three cheers for our restorative hobby. Um, Sadatu, did I did I get your name right? <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, Sadatu, Sa yes. I'm Sadatu Baba. I live in Kaduna in Nigeria. And I'm a lecturer and researcher at a university, at Kaduna State University. And... Um, I love reading and I also love doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> Thank you. We've got some epic hobbies. Uh, Sharu, how, tell me how, oh, I can read it out. I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce things too badly. Hello, my name is Sharu. I live in New York. 
my project is Hive of Heaven, and one of my hobbies is playing piano. Do you have any recordings online? Um, <laughs> please send them. We'd love to if you don't mind sharing. Uh, Joanna or Joanna, over to you. Hello, my name is Joanna. Um, I'm, I currently live in the East Lee. I'm a master's student reading medical imaging and applications. I love cooking. That's my hobby. And then for the project, I'm going to be working on um, data management in um, medical images, basically. Amazing. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, Marwa. And if you prefer to type, that's fine. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Marwa Yas from Iraq. And my favorite uh, hobby is uh, reading and taking care of shade plants. Loving it. All right, Moniki, tell me, did I get your name wrong? I'm so sorry. I'll just be, sit here and be terrified. <laughs> Please, um, if you prefer written, then add it. Oh, you've unmuted. I'll stop. Uh, so my name is Ian Moniki Kanyi, and you, you got my name right. Um, I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, the project I'm supposed to do is how to use deep reinforcement learning to help the differently abled people in our society. And my my hobbies are cooking and 3D uh, designs. Yeah, thank you. Everyone who said cooking, please tell me your recipes, pop those in the random chat. Um, we can just mm, start drooling. <laughs> Samira, over to you. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. OK, OK. I guess uh, from the questions is, uh, OK, I'm from north of Iraq, a city called Erbil. Uh, my uh, i have uh, i'm doing uh, i have a degree in uh, theoretical linguistics uh, but i also like to write about uh, things related to higher education uh, also service learning currently i'm working on a service learning on career guidance across five countries and uh, my hobby is uh, learning new things i don't know if that works thank you i think that works perfectly <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Uh, we have um, Giada, Gaida. Uh, just checking. Uh, it, it's possible I mispronounced your name, uh, and so you didn't pick up that I was calling on you. Ga Gaida, Jaida. Uh, if you can hear us, it would be cool if you could uh, introduce It should me. be Rada. It should be Rada. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You're my hero. Rada, if you can hear us, we'd love to get your introduction. Uh, it's fine to type it in the chat if that's easier. Um, I will, for now, though, move on. Elise Shafsia, who are you? <laughs> Uh, Javsia, can you hear us? Maybe not. Okay, just for the record, Javsia is always in every OLS call. So that's why I was being slightly cheeky when I asked him to, to introduce himself. <laughs> so I think that means we have maybe one person left. Uh, Thafir Mohammed, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? I think he has he has a problem in the voice in the in the your laptop. I, okay. I, I think will we he will uh, write writing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, okay. We have um from Rada. I said that right this time. Might be slightly better. Hello, everyone. I'm a comp sci BSc working on NASA's open data for creating an educational experience using augmented and virtual reality. My hobbies are designing and writing. Wow, okay, we've had so many 
very, very interesting backgrounds joining the call today. Um, but let's actually start moving on and doing the uh, fun stuff, which uh, involves telling you why we're here today. So over to my fantastic colleague, Irene. Thank you, Joe, for hosting this um, introduction round. And yeah, so I will share my screen for a short presentation, just giving you a quick overview of the program. Um, and then we will start with the, um, a fun activity after that. So I am kind of putting this in presenting mode, but I always struggle with that. Let me... Um, Are you looking at my slides? Okay, I'm gonna put that in full screen mode. And okay, so again, welcome everyone. We are so, so happy to have you here today for the first session of the Nebula program that we are doing in collaboration with NASA. Um, again, like we're gonna, leave all the logistics questions at the end. This is a presentation to tell you a little bit about the program, to show you a preview of what you will learn and the motivation behind it. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat or on the notepad and Joe will keep an eye on that um, and we're going to answer that um, at the end. So, okay. Uh, why are we here? I'm sure you all have an idea since you already put the effort to apply and to join. Um, but with, what we believe is that science and society advance best when research is shared with others. And in fact, when people um, have the opportunity to participate in the scientific process as researchers, students, and citizens. So sharing what we're doing with each other uh, so that everyone can benefit from it is the way to make things strongest and most effective. But that is not always easy. There might be concerns about getting scooped or people pointing out a mistake in your work um, or many other reasons why someone might be uh, cautious about working openly. We're also seeing a change in the research landscape where funders or organizations are increasingly expecting researchers to comply with open policies, but not necessarily providing the skills to do that. And so there might be um, a lot of a scattered information for some disciplines and almost no information for some others. And that makes it very overwhelming to get started. What we want to try to do is to help break down those barriers and work towards a cultural change that helps people share their work more responsibly, safely, and effectively. And this is where the Nebula program comes in. The program is for people applying principles, open principles in their work, um, not just individually, but we hope that the practices that you will learn, you will also um, share them with your communities, with people around you, um, that you are able to talk about open science in a more sensible way and maybe help us spread these practices. And when I'm talking about open science, what, what I really mean is any of research or scholarship or research support work from any discipline, whether that's climate um, research and environment or health, engineering, psychology, many other fields and many like professions that are not necessarily just being a researcher, but working in um, science uh, related areas. Each week we will have training calls and you will also meet with your coach. Uh, you will be introduced to your coach this week um, after this session, uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, so the idea of applying with a project is that when you learn something, then you can apply that um, directly and you get that hands-on learning experience. Our program is part of the Transform to Open Science Initiative by NASA, that's DOPS. Uh, which shares our mission to transform organizations and communities towards a more inclusive culture of open science. So I invite you to explore that website to learn more about um, other organizations that are developing materials or providing uh, training for other disciplines and um, different types of training, 
related to open science. And our program builds off of our experience providing training uh, for the past four years. Since 2020, we have run um, eight cohorts and trained um, almost 400 participants across the world um, in open science practices with the help of um, over 300 experts, mentors, coaches, and facilitators. Many people who first participate in the program then come back as an expert in follow-up cohorts. And besides uh, the open science training component of, of our organization, um, OLS also um, has a pillar of research and open practices on interve interventions for broadening the participation in research. And we have a uh, long-term support program that it's the open incubator for researchers to step up into leadership roles. So we're gonna explore many concepts related to open science and help you apply the ones that are most relevant to your work. Here's where talking with a coach will um, be very helpful to give you another perspective of how these practices might apply um, to your work or maybe help you decide when something is just not so not so needed for, for your project. But the idea that the idea is that we can do this like one step at a time and it's okay to decide to use just um, some of the concepts that, that you will be learning. This is just a quick overview of the next six weeks. We are right at the beginning in the um, introduction module. That's the ethos, which uh, here, that means the motivation and the essence of open science. All this information is, is going to be in the website soon. So don't worry about um, reading this now. Um, but I do want to kind of highlight that behind this project, there is a big, uh, team working in different OLS uh, projects. The first people at the top are OLS directors. We have Joe here. And then we have other staff working in different roles. We have fellows, people in finance, web developers, design, um, again, like project specific roles. And that's me as the most recent addition. I'll be coordinating the, the cohorts. So you will be getting a lot of emails from me. But we also have an amazing team of experts. You will get to meet them in the training sessions and also um, they will be coaching um, some of you or some of your projects. Um, here in the session, we have Virginia. Some of these people are part of the team who developed the NASA curriculum. And we're very happy that we now get to teach that material as well. But the OLS community is much, much, much bigger than that. Um, there are over 500 people who have participated or contributed in some way to OLS, and we're very proud of this. Um, and now you are also here. We're also very, very happy to have you. So with that, I'm gonna end this presentation. Um, let me stop the share and see if, Joe, do we have any, uh, maybe one or two questions that we can take? Uh, we didn't get any questions um, in the chat. I don't think we got any in the etherpad either. Um. Okay, well, that's great. Um, there is going to be a space for questions at the end as well. So don't worry if you um, kind of some have questions pop up later. But for now, um, we have now the first activity. And I want to now formally introduce Virginia. She has already told us a bit about herself, but um, she will be our first expert. She will be also coaching some of the projects. So Virginia, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your background? Yes. Thanks, Irene. And once again, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see that so many people is interested in embracing open science. I am one of those persons, so I feel really lucky to share this space with you. I'm actually a marine biologist, but I started the open science journey, which I 
I'm telling you, it's a one-way <laughs> journey. Once you get used to it and you see the benefits that you can get, it's you will always try to do it as every time you can. So I'm actually I I'm gonna be starting this uh, cohort. So please have some patience. But to begin, we wanted to make this a bit interactive. And uh, before starting to tell what is open science, um, we wanted to know what do you think it's open science. So we have prepared a word cloud for you to fill. I am now. Virginia, uh, you muted. Yes, sorry, my bad. Um, we have the link on the etherpad. I don't see the line, sorry, because of my screen, but I will share it as well here. Uh, oh, thank you, Irene, as well. So before we begin, I want to take like two, three minutes for you to express in two or three words, what do you think open science is before starting? Open, I, I, this is Andrew Geronic. Uh, open science is um, free and open access to research content. Um, so that uh, we can better share and collaborate on uh, scientific discovery in particular. Oh, we'll be talking about the definition. Uh, and thank you very much, Andrew. Actually, many of the words you have mentioned are key. And I invite you, if you want, to, to fill in the word cloud. We are putting the link in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. And if you could choose like two or three words, like which are more important for you on how to describe what open science means, that would be awesome. So I'll be give you a two or three minutes more and we'll be, oh, the word cloud is filling. I will share in a bit my screen so you can see the results. But I will give everyone two minutes in case you haven't finished. You can put a thumbs up in case you already did it, or if you need more time, maybe a thumbs down. <laughs> I know that we have that emoji. <laughs> Great. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Awesome. Also through the chat as well. Okay. So maybe we are already able to share some of the results. And I will share my screen for a second. Are you seeing my screen right now? Yes. Great, wait, I have to move this and I will present it. So we have so many awesome answers, 43 words actually. And I love that the main word is collaboration because this is a really important thing. And I know that some words are almost similar. Oh. Shared knowledge, mentoring, open access, NASA funded. Yes, this is actually funded by NASA. <laughs> That's also true. Oh, I love the word impact right there. You already are making an impact by joining uh, this program. So, so awesome to see that. New venues, transdisciplinary. We will be talking a bit about that later. Oh, so awesome words. So, I will, the word cloud will be open and I will share it afterwards in my slides so you have access to it. And I'm like pretty curious of what you will be saying at the end of the program. So maybe we could redo this cloud. But all of you have said so many words that actually are really important for what open science is. And we'll be talking about this in a bit. So I will, 
escape this and I will start sharing the presentation. So everyone can see it okay? Yes, awesome. So welcome again, as uh, I was saying, today we will be talking about what is open science and why it is important. It is, this is like the first part of describing about this program. I am Virginia Garcia Alonso, and just in case you missed it, you can still join the word cloud and put some words uh, of what do you think open science is. So, well, let's see some definitions. And before I wanted to tell you how we are going to organize this meeting, we'll do like a first part of describing what open science is, say, we will see some definitions, some motivations, and who does open science. We'll end this part with a small exercise, and then we'll have a second part telling why is open science important and how it benefits different participants. And we can finish with a small uh, exercise, but in case we don't get to, to the time, don't worry, you can do it later. So, okay, what is open science? So many words and definitions. Well, we have one definition provided by the Open Science 101 curriculum, which I think is really good, which is that open science is a principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaboration, reproducibility, and equity. And this is actually a definition that was adapted from a document by the White House Office of Science and Technology. So, well, that is a really, really long description of what open science is. So let's break this down a bit, like what does each part means? And first and foremost, the idea of making research products and processes available to all and not just to some people that have access to things. It's like one of the main things behind open science. Also, being respecting of diverse cultures. This means fostering an open dialogue between researchers, indigenous people, and local communities, and not just researchers like many may believe. This also includes respecting that there is a diverse um, environment with different laws and customs in different countries and or as they apply to different kinds of research. And although we strive to make things as open as possible, we know there are certain sensitive information that should still remain protected. So not everything should be open or the different ways to make it open. So afterwards, along the course, you will go a bit deeper on this. And last but not least are these ideas of fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. And the first two are mainly related to research standards, but the, la the latter refers to the inclusion of people who might otherwise be left out. And that's something like that it's also really important in terms of making science open. And more or less, like to sum it up, there is this idea of open science, the fact that it should be inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible. And that is uh, a resumed way of seeing of what open science is. Yet, there's not a correct definition of what open science is, since open science is really multifaceted and it can mean so many different things to many people. And just to give you some examples, I have taken some definitions from different organizations. For example, even NASA Top gives like a resumed version of what open science uh, is. And it describes open science as a nuanced way of sharing the process and products of science. We also have a definition by the European Research Agency, Executive Agency, sorry which describes open science as an approach to research based on open cooperative work that emphasizes the sharing of knowledge, results, and tools as early and widely as possible. For example, here to make it as soon as possible is something important. 
for the European Research Agency. And well, uh, there's also a UNESCO definition, but besides the definition itself, just wanted to let you know that there's no correct definition of what open science is, and you may be more comfortable with some aspects of open science than other, and that's totally okay. So you can choose what you can use, what is beneficial for you and your projects, and always bear in mind like the idea of open science, and that would be more than okay. Great. So what are the motivations and the goals behind making science open. There will be a bit more about this in part two of these presentations, but mainly there are some lists that we can do uh, to explain about it. So of course, including open science practices enables greater transparency in the scientific process, and it also makes scientific knowledge more accessible to the public and that this combats misinformation that is a really important problem in, in this society right now. It also facilitates reproducibility, sorry, and it enables collaboration and inclusion. I really enjoy seeing people from so many places in this world right now joining. And I think this is like a really important um, representation of this collaboration and inclusion. And also that collaboration was the word that was mostly um, written in the word cloud, so lovely. And of course, something that maybe people don't know about, but communities working together on a problem can find new results and, and tackle that problem more rapidly. And also the feedback can validate results in a more robust manner. So everything makes the research process best. And why now? Why open science right now? Well, <laughs> thanks to the digital resources like the internet that are nowadays more common, uh, we have eliminated some barriers for digital collaboration. We can be having these Zoom meetings, for example. Still, uh, we have some challenges, especially when the internet is not that good. Some people don't have access to computational tools or to phones. And of course, language barriers like myself, <laughs> that I'm not a native English speaker, so I try to do my best. But yes, there are some things that can be um, tackled in the future and should be, but OLS always tries to, to make you feel comfortable. So don't, please don't mind asking if you don't understand something or write in the chat. And well, we've seen what is open science, what are the motivations, why now, and who does open science? Many of us relate open science to researchers. I myself am a marine biologist, and that's how I started. But actually, open science does, doesn't only involve researchers. It involves many other stakeholders that are affected by the outcomes of open science or are actually involved in producing open science documents. And what are these stakeholders? Are any individuals who can affect or be affected by open science. So here is an image at the right where you can see some of the many stakeholders. This is not limited. So if maybe you are somebody else, but um, just as an example, there are policy makers, there are community managers, of course, educators, which are so important, um, citizen scientists, people who are our neighbors and don't necessarily applicate uh, research, but enjoy being part and making a difference, journalists, engineers, and actually the list goes on and on. So everyone in this society, in, in each society will be affected by science research. So everyone can be actually a stakeholder. And although we have seen who does open science, this isn't as simple. There are actually interactions between these stakeholders and between science and society based on these three main groups, which are researchers, the general public, and policy makers. Fortunately, these interactions are mainly advantages 
and this should be our north always. It's something that is a work on a working a work on progress, sorry. But um, it's really interesting how these three groups intersect towards open science. And here are just some examples about that too. For example, researchers do science and share the results with policymakers and the general public to inform their decisions and improve their lives. Also, this is a really important um, role of the public that helps to fund research in many countries through taxes and can provide input to future areas of study. If we acknowledge there's a problem, maybe more funds can go there and the research can go to try to solve that problem. And also, for example, policymakers help to implement measures that are informed by scientific results to improve the health, environment, and liability of society. So we will see some examples of how open science um, have benefited some of these groups afterwards. But just bear in mind that it's not just who does open science, but also the relationship between the different stakeholders. Great. And I don't know if anyone has a question, they would, this would be like a good time to do so. I'm taking, I'm checking in the chat if there are any questions and please don't mind if you want to unmute yourself. And of course, if you have any questions afterwards, I will be checking the document. Yes, Irene, sorry. Thank you, Virginia. I was going to say we didn't have any questions on the pad or the chat. Um, again, as you said, there will be time at the end for, for more. Great. So if there are no questions, we wanted you to answer who are you in open science? What kind of stakeholder are you? Are you maybe a researcher, an educator, a policymaker, a data manager, or maybe something we didn't mention? And for that, uh, the idea is to go into the breakout rooms to briefly introduce yourself if you want and to answer this question. Before oh, we get yes. into this, yeah. I, I, you were mentioning there's a question in the chat, right? <laughs> Great. So yes, Madison is asking, what in your opinion is your favorite type of open science? Oh, is there a particular stakeholder that you feel has more importance? Well, I don't think I have a favorite type of open science. I mean, there are so many things we can do to make science open. I do believe that one of the things that is missing and and it's a great idea to continue building on is the idea of citizen science. I mean, they are the basis for everything that we do, at least in my case, I'm a researcher and I was um, formed in public universities that are funded by taxes. And I really see that there is still a lack of communication between the general communities and what their problems are and what we are doing and what we could do. So I would definitely say that citizen science and communicators and educators are like the basis that need to be strengthened, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I don't know if anyone has another question. Yes, Samira, can you give examples how each of the possible stakeholders contribute to open science? Yes, um, of course, researchers are the ones who um, have certain ideas and they put it into practice. They search if their hypotheses are true or not. <laughs> but yes, educators, for example, can actually make their documentations open, for everyone and not just their students. Of course, well, data managers, the idea of sharing data 
of making it as um, intuitive as possible and not just for researchers to understand is also something really important that could be done. Um, yes. And we will see some other examples of um, implement of real implementation of open science in the second part. So don't worry that we will have some more examples. Yes, researchers are easy to get. <laughs> um, um, I know if you or Yene have another example they will want to share. Uh, I might be inclined to just add that um, as an example, if you were doing a study on mental health, that you might want to make sure that the people who experience the mental health uh, phenomenon that you're studying are involved with the design of the study, um, such that you're actually doing work that isn't exploitative, that benefits people and that addresses real needs. Because too often we risk the ivory tower doing what we think is interesting, but actually because we haven't really been involved with the people affected, it's no good. Uh, I had an example um, of an attempt at citizen science um, in um, Vicenza in Venice in Italy, uh, where we were talking about flooding. Um, and also, and it was also in the UK, but we had a QR code and smartphones and people could snap the QR code on the bridge and say, there's a flood here. But we didn't talk to the citizens before we did this. And when we tried giving the smartphone app to all of our flood wardens, we discovered they were elderly people with no smartphones. Hmm. Or maybe their energy was cut out by the flooding. <laughs> <laughs> and couldn't charge it. Yes. Yes, going to the basis, I think it would be like the most concrete example. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the other uh, stakeholders. Like, for example, those most of these people, I mean, they are they willing really to share? I mean, the researchers, are, it's difficult. I, 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 this is the main, the critical thing that I'm still, um, I'm not sure about how uh, we can uh, let people, like technicians, like journalists, like engineers, uh, share their ideas, thoughts freely to everyone, how they can survive and uh, protect their business. Well, that was something that in the definition was taken into consideration. Although we strive to make open science as open as possible, as you mentioned, there are some things that still need to be like taken care of. And actually throughout the course, you will be seeing examples of how to share data, when to share it, in which places to share it, or how to share your, um, of course, your protocols. I mean, today with digital, with the digital era, you can make maybe a blog post sharing how you did something, uh, create a website in which to share how you are planning to do your work, your steps, your milestones. But yes, um, it's a hard one. And of course, for example, policymakers have to have some confidential things first, but then they can make it also accessible to the public. Uh, and it's, yes, it, it's there is no one correct answer to everything. And as I mentioned before, there are some things that may be useful for you and others that don't, and that's okay because it's dependent on your project and on what are your goals. I see, I see. Can I ask another question about the researchers since I'm a researcher? Uh, I or... I don't know if we have time, actually. Okay. If, okay. if you want, okay. you can write it down and I will gladly answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, thank you for your interest. Okay, okay. So Shall I open I was... this breakout? Yes, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, uh, folks, just as a reminder, this is a couple of minutes uh, each to introduce yourself. We've got groups of three or four. Uh, and if you need any help, uh, you can use the ask for help button and we will transport and come and save you. Uh, but you have 10 minutes.
So hi, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good discussion. We're going to wait for 30 seconds until the rest of the participants are back. Um, yeah. OK, I think everyone is joining. And 10 more seconds. People are, I see in, in, the, in the breaker rooms that they're still discussing. So I'm sorry if we interrupted the, the discussion. Um, but I think everyone is back now. Um, again, like I hope that you had a great discussion. Um, we are, um, we have some limited time. So if you have some insights to share about your breakout rooms, please share that in the notepad. Uh, we have some space for that. Um, and next, Virginia has the second part of, of her presentation uh, about why open science is important. So Virginia, please share your screen. Yes, thanks, Irene. I will share in a bit. Um, just one second. And so everyone should be watching my full screen. Perfect. So we have discussed what is open science, and now we will look a little bit more at why is open science important. So we all know we face both known and unforeseen challenges in this world. And these dynamic challenges demand a new approach to science that achieves success through a responsive and inclusive scientific ecosystems. And this requires more diverse teams, teams with people from different places that think differently, that have different experiences and that wish to participate. So open science is important for many different reasons, but especially because it benefits different parts of the 